Well, there we go. Well, we're joined in the studio by former Detective Chief Superintendent of the Met, Kevin Hurley. Thank you very, very much for joining us, Kevin. Look, you've obviously been sitting here a little while now and listening to all of this. What's your take overall on this? Should she ever be released from prison, do you think? What she did was utterly appalling. I've dealt with some cases like that in the past. And it's quite disappointing that under the sentencing guidelines, what she was convicted of, she in fact only received five years. But as I understand it, I think she also got what's called an indeterminate public mm. protection order. The shame about which means that a person will be kept in until the parole board uh, decide that they're not a risk to the public. Oh. Unfortunately, that order is no longer a sentence that can be given because it's been removed, uh, brought in, I think, by the Labour government. Mm. <clears throat> She'd been sent back to prison on the, on the last occasion because she effectively breached some of the licensing conditions. Mm. She's still subject to that IPP, as it's called, mm. so she could uh, be called back when she offends again, and undoubtedly uh, she will, will do. You know, from a person who's dealt with these offences all my life, I am appalled that someone who's done something like that has effectively only served seven or eight years mm. in closed conditions yes. and the other in open prison, because for a mother, who is, if you like, the ultimate protector of the child, to be involved in this and then allow her partner and partner's brother to do what they did to her baby is truly um, appalling. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, the, the Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab, did try and, you know, get this looked at and sort of thrown out, but, sadly, the parole board did think um, she was fit um, for release. We speak a lot on this channel about these sorts of cases. We have the case of Arthur Labinia Hughes, Star Hobson, others. Um, and even with older cases, it always seems that they never get enough time uh, in prison, the people who commit these crimes. Uh, why, why are our sentencing guidelines so pathetic? And why does the parole board seem to let people out when common sense would dictate they're not fit to be let out? Look at Colin Pitchfork, for example. Mm. Yep, indeed. I think it's because in this country we've moved away from the idea that prison should in fact be a punishment, a serious sanction. And whilst it's quite right that we take the opportunity to rehabilitate certain types of people, there is an issue where society demands that people actually suffer significant punishment for whatever uh, they've done that's truly horrendous. And Colin Pitchfall is yet another case, murdered and raped uh, two women, in fact, the first case ever solved by uh, DNA. For that person ever to be mm. thought of suitable to come out of prison is truly appalling. So I think there's an issue in terms of sentencing guidelines Generally, it's not actually the judge's fault with some mm. of these sentences. Mm. They are constrained by the sentencing council and the judge, therefore, has got quite strict rules. It meets this band, that band. They can sentence accordingly. I think there's probably a case for the Justice Secretary, um, who, of course, I know follows this same view because he, Dominic Rabb, was keen to retain this lady in prison or woman monster, mm. actually, yeah. uh, in prison. I can't say that. I, c I couldn't have said that when I was in the police, but monster <laughs> was the correct word. Mm. Um, <clears throat> for him to get a team together to revisit the sentencing guidelines and see if that element of both prison and public protection is quite right in terms of the balance. Mm. Yeah, I'm quite keen to touch on something that you alluded to earlier, which is about how you yourself have dealt with similar cases. And I I'm always very keen to know how the police feel about these incidents. I mean, do you find it very, very difficult to not show some kind of, like, visceral rage towards the offender in these cases? You must have to see and, frankly, do some pretty horrible... I have, I've dealt with very similar cases with mothers who didn't look too different to that, where right. you go into houses where there's dog faeces, human faeces on the floor. The bath is full of dirty old tins and rubbish and food, bin bags everywhere. In fact, we use a phrase, the kind of place you wipe your feet on the pavement when you leave. The point, you are right. In fact, you have a real sense internally of rage and anger, but you're there to do a professional job for the victim, which in this case is a child, and if you allow that to interfere with your professional judgment mm -hmm. in how you conduct the interviews, gather the evidence, then you're not, you're not doing, doing what's needed to get justice to the victim. Yeah. So I can remember one specific case, horrific child, severely shaken, permanently brain damaged, sitting down quite nicely with someone who smelt horribly um, and giving a cup of tea and biscuits and a partner a cup of tea and biscuits and being ever so polite and nice, even when I greeted him, shaking my, his hand, 
because what you want to do is get them to talk to you so that you can gather the appropriate evidence yeah. to get them mm. in prison for as long as you possibly can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, I, I completely admire the job um, our police do. Of course, there are a few bad apples we hear about all the time, but I do have massive amounts of admiration for the profession. And that leads me um, on to our next question, which is something we'll also be talking about later, is this idea that, you know, police are sort of wearing rainbow flags and rainbow caps and you, they're letting criminals identify as 67 genders, some of some police forces... I mean, do you find all this stuff quite trivial and quite embarrassing, actually? And, you, you know, should people be allowed to identify 67 genders if, if they're a criminal? What does that even mean? Well, I don't know what that means, but what I can say about police wearing various motifs like rainbow <laughs> epaulets, rainbow um, shoelaces or even helmets which is totally inappropriate. The role of police is to be completely apolitical and not su show support for any group. So, for example, if someone should turn up wearing rainbow colours on the edge of the epaulets because their chief constables are doing it, which they do, and you turn up to a religious community, whether it's Christian mm. or uh, Muslim, mm -hmm. to whom the idea of someone being LGBT is an anathema, you're actually throwing mm. that in their face. So, and, and let me be clear, if someone is from the LGBTQ community, that's fine, I have no issues. But politically, police must avoid showing support for any group. Um, so I, I actually think we're going down a, a route of some quite weakness and wokeness mm. with senior police leadership. The reason the police are here is to serve the public, to protect them and look after the vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. That's where they should be focusing on, regardless of who, what... Or, or whatever their gender is and mm -hmm. what they look like. That's their job. Well, I wish you were head of the Met. We, we wouldn't have half of these problems, would well, we? Well, may I say, <laughs> I've just been rejected in oh, the uh, six applicants for the Met on Friday, so oh, you won't be seeing me saying, clean your shoes, wear your hat, answer the phone, be a bit more professional, or alternatively saying, we, the police, never back down when we're confronted. Mm. The public... Ex you know, one of the things that really annoys me, yeah. and it was when I was in the police, I'd, I'd come in and find out, what's gone on last night? Oh... We, we backed off this estate when we were confronted by the community. They are not the community. They are the yobs who yeah. terrify the community, mm. which is the postman, the school dinner lady, the nighttime auxiliary nurse, yeah. carer. When you back down, you give it over to the yobs. The police have lost the plot at senior le leadership level with some of the stuff they're doing. And I might say with the current College of Policing, which sets out their doctrine, I look at some of their stuff... It's quite appalling. Let me give you an example. Everyone's backing off about Taser. What they don't understand about Taser is actually it's far less injurious than someone kicking or punching you or hitting you with a button. It's a low amperage shock that destabilises you for five seconds and it's all over. If a panicking policewoman or policeman hits you repeatedly with a metal button, you're going to hospital. But no one gets out there and explains to people the reality of it. I would yeah. have liked to see much more robust policing and a return to better standards mm. and values within the police in terms of dignity okay. and professionalism. Absolutely. Stuff, I mean, well, Absolutely. look, thank you very much, of course, Kevin Hurley there, former Detective Chief Superintendent of the Met Police. And, um, yeah, I've actually been thinking about trying to... Uh, get tasered, so I can not like, but not 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 just by committing a crime, um, just to so kind of know what it feels like. But anyway, maybe one day, maybe one day that could be sorted out for you. But anyway, Kevin, thank I'd you very much. I'd be happy to volunteer. I'm sure you would, yes, yeah. but I would want someone who would actually eventually let go of the taser.